Our first panel is titled Congo and Africa One, and it deals with the origins of the Congo Kingdom and early modern Congo Kingdom, including encounters with Europe and the Atlantic world. Our panel will last an hour and a half. The first portion will be a joint presentation between Kuhn Boston and Pierre de Marais. Um, Kuhn is from the University of Ghent and the University of Brussels, and Pierre de Marais is from the University of Brussels and Royal Museum for Central Africa. Uh, the sec in their panel, I'm sorry, is calling Probing the Congo Past, New Archaeological and Linguistic Insights. You can see it on the screen. Cecile Fromont will be our second panelist. Her panel is entitled Visual and Material Culture and Early Exchanges Between Congo and Europe. Um, uh, Pierre and Kahn's um, presentation will last for 40 minutes and Cecile's for 20. Our discussant today is John Thornton from the uh, University of Boston or Boston University. Um, we will have at least half an hour for discussion if we maintain the time schedule. And I have my iPad with a counter on it. I will give um, a signal five minutes before the end, and I really appreciate it if everyone would adhere to this. We will um, try to be as strict as possible, but I do want to have a nice, lively discussion at the end, and I'm sure we will. Uh, another thing is we will have a nice half-hour coffee break in the lobby again after this panel and before the second panel starts, and then we'll have lunch. So would you welcome our panelists, please? Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you, everybody, for organizing this fantastic exhibit, this uh, very exciting uh, conference, and uh, the opportunity to uh, share our passion for Congo history and past and art, of course. The fact that we, we meet here today uh, in Florida some five centuries after the discovery by Portuguese sailor of the Congo Kingdom and some something like 7,000 miles away from the Congo Kingdom uh, demonstrate his uh, uh, far-reaching and uh, long-lasting influence uh, in many ways that people don't even realize uh, Congo had an incredible impact on, on world history in many, in many aspects. When, when they discovered the, the Congo Kingdom, the Europeans were absolutely fascinated to engage with a kingdom who remind them very much of what they know in Europe, uh, like Portuguese or Portugal or French or Spanish kingdom. And uh, they uh, treated uh, accordingly. Um, and the way for European at that time to deal with the kingdom, if they recognized it as a king, and the king eventually became Christianized very early, with the earliest bishop in sub-Saharan Africa very early on, was of course to uh, proceed diplomatically, exchanging ambassador and, and trading with them. And uh, it was an amazing structure with its own money, a very complex economy, a very complex uh, political organization, and its uh, influence and its symbolic significance still endure very much today in Africa and <coughs> abroad, like you demonstrate so well with this exhibit. Sorry. So, of course, exchanging ambassador, that was one way uh, kind of representation of, of it. Maybe we, we could turn the, some of the light on the screen down a bit. I think it would be easier, nicer. And, and this is also, I mean, this is a, a piece for a Hollywood fiction uh, movie. You know, the story of this ambassador who took several years to reach from the Baza Congo, the capital of the kingdom, the, the Pope, and, and die just before meeting the Pope after, I think, four or five years of traveling. Uh, it's, it's an amazing story, and his bust, and it's represented in the catalog, uh, is, is still there. 
also uh, it was one of the first opportunity for the European to go beyond the shoreline of Africa and to see what was going on inside. And this is also very, very important. This was the first, one of the very first instances where Europeans get to know what Africa was besides just the outpost on the trading on the shoreline. Banza Congo was represented in many uh, etching and uh, uh, on a very dramatic way. Uh, today it, it's less dramatic. The, the river actually was never as wide as this. Today the same picture is more or less that's what it looks like. The, the long-lasting influence of the, the kingdom is also being felt today in many ways and one of the major local Congolese church the Kibangists, after Simon Kibangu, are trying to recuperate as well, mixing Kimpahita, the major figures of uh, Congo history and messianic movement, uh, with uh, Simon Kibangu and the, what's little, what remain of the huge cathedral built by the uh, missionaries in Banza Congo, in the former capital, has become a kind of iconic place for many traditions today. At the same time, at the same time, the Angolese government, with different speed and interest, uh, are trying to put it in the World Heritage List. So, in many ways, the uh, importance, the symbolic significance of the kingdom endures. So, the Congo Kingdom, six core province, and we will be speaking quite a bit about them are more or less that. It's, it's kind of difficult. This is based on John Thornton's work, but it's a kind of very schematic because the size and the shape of the various provinces uh, kept moving. You have Banza Congo, which is the, the, the capital in northern Angola today, and you have several of the capital. And we have been working lately mostly in, around the Inkisi River. Uh, we know that the Inkisi was a major uh, center of population and trade. And uh, we have been uh, doing uh, archaeological research around Banzan Sumbi and uh, Banzan Bata, and our linguistic work has been uh, a bit more widespread. So as uh, Pierre told, thanks to this very early European uh, African context, uh, the Congo Kingdom is certainly within Central Africa, one of the best known uh, regions from a historical point of view, but also since the 19th century uh, from an art historical uh, and anthropological point of view. And um, so we have a, a very deep knowledge of Congo history for the last uh, 500 years. But one of the, the things we do not have or which had never been done or never systematically be done is uh, uh, archaeological and historical linguistic um, research pertaining specifically to the Congo Kingdom. And that's why in uh, some years back, uh, Pierre and I developed an uh, interdisciplinary archaeological and linguistic, historical linguistic um, research project, which uh, got be funded by the European Research Council, uh, aiming at an interdisciplinary study um, focusing mainly on uh, archaeology and um, historical linguistics in order to better understand the origins and early history of the Congo Kingdom, uh, to see uh, how uh, social and political complexity grew uh, within the lower Congo region and uh, how this was connected with the, the rise of uh, a, a local form of urbanism. Uh, also how um, this uh, centralization had an impact on language evolution uh, within the lower Congo area. And um, so we, we started our Congo King project, you might have seen our, our website, uh, congoking.org, uh, two years ago in 2012. And what we want to present today is, is uh, some preliminary first results of our, our research. And um, from a linguistic point of view, one of the first things we wanted to do was uh, to to see Congo history or Congo language history within a wider uh, historical perspective. And of course, uh, you know that uh, uh, Congo or Kikongo is, uh, is a Bantu language and it's, uh, uh, it's arrived somehow or uh, uh, reached the lower Congo region uh, as part of the uh, Bantu expansion. And 
Uh, for our linguistic research, uh, we uh, identified uh, a number of uh, something like 30 different Kikongo varieties uh, which were available through existing documentation. Uh, some of, of them we also did uh, around fieldwork in, in the Lower Congo in 2012. And our linguistic research is based on this uh, variety of Congo um, dialects or, or uh, varieties which are representing linguistic diversity within the Lower Congo region. And we tend to call this uh, Kikongo dialect continuum because it's a, a long uh, continuum of varieties which are, which if they are neighboring they are intercomprehensible. But the further the further you uh, re get removed to the to the periphery, the less uh, interintelligible these uh, dialects uh, become. And so one of the things we we have been doing is is very traditional historical linguistic research. It's lexical statistics and. Because if we want to understand how the kingdom uh, impacted uh, language evolution uh, within the Lower Congo, we have to understand uh, how the, the Congo, the Lower Congo region, looked like linguistically before the expansion of, of the kingdom. And uh, linguistic research uh, tend to um, rely on what is called a basic vocabulary, which is less. Uh, 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 which is more resistant to borrowing to understand deep linguistic uh, relations. And if we look at this uh, classification, we see that the Congo languages uh, are Guthrie's own age, for those who are familiar with, with Guthrie's classification, are part of a wider uh, West Bantu branch, which is called West uh, Coastal. And We've done a, a very detailed study of uh, all these different Kikongo varieties uh, with, uh, uh, we, we examined their relations with, with surrounding languages and what we see is that they, they are part of a bigger West Coast group uh, to, to which also belong languages from Southern Gabon, uh, languages from the Quilo region in the Congo, uh, then our uh, Congo group uh, very important, of which is all uh, the B40 languages, the Punu Shira languages of uh, southern, southwestern Gabon are part of this historical unit. And then we have a number of southwestern Bantu languages to which Kimbundu belongs. So, like Kimbundu, it's southern neighbor, it's, it's clearly distinct or it's belonging to, uh, it's a distant relative only of uh, Kikongo. And if based on this uh, early classification, what is very important is that our Kikongo group is one um, historical genetic uh, unit. And the Lower Congo, from the point of view of Bantu expansion, it's important to realize that it's an area of later settlement. So languages did not expand from the Lower Congo region, they, they arrived in the Congo region. So it, it was a, a um, an area uh, which, where, where Bantu speech communities came to settle in, uh, in the later stage. And so the, the, the note of highest linguistic diversity is situated outside uh, the Lower Congo region. And while this is very tentative, we would tend to situate uh, the, the center of diffusion of the, the West Coastal languages upstream uh, in the wider vicinity of the, the Bateke plateau from which uh, Kikongo, uh, or the ancestors of Kikongo, uh, arrived in the lower uh, Congo region. And if we look now at the internal classification of um, the Congo group, we see four clear-cut, you, you will see five, but there are actually four clear-cut uh, distinct uh, subunit subgroups uh, within the Congo group. An eastern group, uh, which is situated entirely east of the Inkisi River. The, the best known variety is Kintandu. Uh, then you have a northern group, which is actually the Congo languages of Congo Brazzaville, or most of them. It's, it's very distinct within uh, the Congo Kikongo dialect continuum. Then you have a southern group, which is the group uh, to which Kisi Congo, uh, Kisolongo, uh, Ki Zombo belong, these are the varieties actually linked to the, to the heartland of, of the Congo Kingdom. And then we have a large northwestern or western group, 
uh, to which varieties like Vili, uh, uh, linked to the Luango Kingdom, um, Moyo, linked to the Goyo Kingdom, and very other, uh, 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 very big diversity of other languages linked to, to other uh, smaller kingdoms in the area like Kakongo are linked. And linked to this, uh, sorry, subunit of Northwest languages are these Pulu Shira languages of Southern Gabon, which are uh, an outlier, can be considered as an outlier of the uh, Congo uh, dialect uh, continuum. And we ha then have a fifth group, which is uh, a central group, which we consider to be a kind of contact zone and to which varieties like Kimanyanga or uh, Kindibu belong. And they are, why they are a contact zone, if you, uh, of course, the tree we're showing here is it's, uh, it's phylogenetic and, and you, according to the calculations you make, you, you get different uh, outcomes. And the four other uh, units are very stable. You get them through all different kinds of calculations. While the affiliations of Kimanyanga and Kidibu tend to change according to the calculations. Once uh, Kidibu goes with the south and Kimanyanga with the north, and uh, in other trees you get you get them together as a central zone. And we actually know, uh, uh, for instance, from La Mansburg that, that this zone was a, was a buffer zone, a sort of contact zone between southern and northern Kikongo. And that is also what is reflected in our classification. So if we look at language dynamics in the lower Congo region, what we see is that rivers play, the, it's not a big surprise, we know that rivers tend to play a, 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 an important role in language evolution, but that was the case in the lower Congo. Uh, mainly the Congo and Inkisi rivers play an important role in the diversification of the Kikongo group. So we have a group east of the Inkisi, a group north of the Congo, uh, a group south of the Congo, and then uh, a central Congo contact group between south and north uh, Kikongo. What is important from the point of view of Kong Kikongo history is that the Kikongo, what we call the Kikongo dialect continuum, its formation, its diversification predates considerably uh, the rise of the Congo uh, Kingdom. It's, um, and this is illustrated here uh, quite well in this uh, uh, chart of cognacy rates between uh, some Kikongo varieties. If you, for instance, take Chivili, uh, you see that it only has 40% of uh, vocabulary shared with, with some of the other varieties like Kisuni, Kinkano, Kindibu, uh, Kisikongo, which means if, if we, but we don't believe in that, but if we take the traditional glottochronological uh, rates of change, that means 20% per thousand years, that would mean that they, this, the group split up 3,000 years ago. So we know that language change uh, went faster, but it's just to say that it's the, the diversification within Kikongo is quite high, and it's not, uh, its spread is certainly a phenomenon predating uh, the uh, rise of the Congo Kingdom.